Christ died for us. He died for me. He died for you. And that's the good news. Isn't that right, church? Amen. That's really, really good news. We are glad that those who have uh, decided to come and worship with us this morning. Uh, we are blessed by your presence. And it is our prayer and hope that we can be a blessing to one another this morning as we worship our God in spirit and in truth this morning. We are in week 29 of our 30-week series, and today we are speaking about gentleness. And then in a few weeks, we're going to end our series on humility. I believe that's September the 18th. But you know, uh, have you ever shipped anything that needed to be handled with care? Anything that's fragile, you've done that. You've gone into a UPS store, a FedEx store, and they um, put your package together in these uh, boxes, and, and on different sides of the boxes, they have handle with care or uh, a fragile. And there's a reason for that. It's because of the contents on the inside, so that they can arrive safely without any damage occurring to those packages. I've seen the special reports just like many of you have, maybe on Dateline or 2020, where you see these package handlers. They'll take the packages, and even though that they say handle with care or, or fragile on the outside, they toss them up on the porch or they throw them. And then what ends up happening is that the contents on the inside are damaged goods. It's an ideal, uh, it's an ideal perfect world when these packages would be gently placed in their appropriate spot, correct? Mm -hmm. And nothing would ever be damaged. However, in the real world, fragile and handled with care doesn't mean too much. What if God were to have placed fragile or handled with care across our foreheads or across our chest? Would that also be ignored? How often is the heart of an individual crushed or a child broken with the words that we use in the actions that we display? Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start off with verse number 1. Philippians chapter 4, starting with verse number 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syndicate to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In this last uh, chapter of Philippians, we find Paul's admonition to the church at Philippi. And what Paul said to the church at Philippi, he said, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. I'm going to speak with you for a few moments this morning on do the right thing. Do the right thing. Over the years, uh, uh, many have tried to define the word gentleness. Some have said that gentleness is about being patient, or it's about being gentle. Some say it's about being reasonable or one who is probably a matis, the individual. And others say it's about being soft-natured. Some say it's about being courteous and gracious to others or the ability to give way to the wishes to someone else. Maybe some of those things are, are true. And, uh, I mean, I don't know for certain. But one thing I do know for sure is that gentleness is the opposite of stubbornness and thoughtlessness. It's about being sacrificial, not out of necessity, but out of generosity, out of sympathy. And sometimes it may be out of empathy because some of you have experienced that yourselves 
in your own lives. This type of kindness and gentleness we speak of this morning was embodied in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When Jesus said to the woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, sir. Jesus said, neither will I. Then go and sin no more. That was kindness and gentleness on his part. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, that was gentleness and kindness on his part. When he said, today you will be with me in paradise, Jesus could have called a legion of angels. That was kindness and gentleness on his part. We learned um, in the book of Galatians a few weeks ago that as we grow in our Christian walk, as we mature, the Holy Spirit is the one that works in us to become more like Jesus. Gentleness is not meekness, church. It's not just meekness, but it's more than that. Gentleness is not weakness. Weakness is displayed in other forms. It's about having humility and thankfulness toward God and toward others. As Christians, we are called to have this personal quality of gentleness in our lives. Especially elders. They are to have gentleness in their lives. Paul tells elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, not to be given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Teachers are to have this quality as well. They are to display this virtue. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 24, 25, and 26, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. But all Christians are to display this gentleness, aren't we, church? Paul said in Titus chapter 3, we are always to be gentle toward everyone. But isn't this a difficult thing to do? Probably not for you, right? <laughs> you probably got it all down pat. You got it 100% accurate. But if you're anything like me at all, at times I struggle with this thing called gentleness. You see, it's easy to be considerate. It's easy to be kind and gentle towards some people. They have a gentle spirit about themselves. They are some lovable human beings. They are meek. They're considerate themselves. But there are some folk you just have a hard time getting your arms around. Am I telling the truth? Amen. They get on your last nerve, amen? <laughs> they don't want to speak to you. They are unkind, they're thankless, and they're just some different folk. It's difficult to show a spirit of gentleness towards these kind of people. And if you're anything like me, if you got blood running through your veins this morning, you know that I'm telling the truth, amen? amen. There are just some people, no matter what you try to do, they are difficult as the day is long. Amen. You try to do the right thing by them, but they keep biting your hand. Brings us to the story about Joseph and his brothers. Way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 37. If you'll turn there with me. Genesis chapter 37. We're going to look at verses 3 and 4. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. For him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Have you ever had a really, really, really bad day? I know that I have. See, I had the middle child syndrome when I was growing up. And I had some really, really, really bad days. 
Things didn't always go my way. I kept getting in trouble over and over again, mostly due to mishaps of my own. But not Joseph. What makes Joseph so interesting, what makes his story so interesting, is that in the midst of all his troubles, in the midst of all his difficult situations, throughout his entire life, he shows tremendous courage. Joseph was the second of the twelve boys born to Jacob. And not only did Joseph's brothers hate him, but they couldn't say a kind word to him. And because they saw that their father favored him more than the other boys, they despised Joseph because uh, Joseph had this dream that indicated that one day you would bow down to me. He told him, I mean, his father, that all of you one day will bow down to me. But I mean, in addition to that, listen to this, brothers. In addition to that first dream, I had another dream, and I dreamt that. The sun, moon, and the 11 stars would also bow down to me. I can imagine his brother saying, you must be kidding me. I'm the one who helped to raise you. I helped to feed you when daddy was away. I helped to change your diapers. You're saying I'm going to bow down to you? You snot-nosed, brat, 17-year-old kid. Get out of my face. You must be kidding me. I will never bow down to you. One day, Joseph's father had to go check on his brothers to see what they were up to. I mean, if you remember earlier, uh, they were attending flock for their dad, him and his brothers. And Jacob, Joseph came back and he delivered a bad report about his brothers. So obviously, the other brothers weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. So. So the brothers had gone to graze again for their father. And Joseph's daddy said, I want you to go check on your brothers again. See what they're up to. See if they're doing what they need to be doing and bring me back a report. So Joseph went and he found his brothers near the dope. But if you recall, his, his uh, brothers saw him coming from a distance. And they had this little meeting that they got together. They put their heads together. I mean, they plotted against their brother. They said, let's kill that little 17-year-old kid. I mean, he gets on my nerves anyway. But then they had a second thought. They said, instead of killing him, let's throw him into this cistern. Let's throw him down this well. So they stripped him of the robe that his daddy gave him, and they threw him down into this empty well. And later, you see that they had another change of heart. Maybe they had some sympathy. And they said, well, I mean, instead of killing them, instead of leaving them there in the well, let's sell them off into slavery. How kind of them. Sold them off into slavery. For guess what? 20 measly shekels of silver. Do you know what that's worth today? Worth about $5.60 today. Not much. They took a piece of his clothing back to his father, Jacob. But they dipped it in goat's blood before they took it to him. And it made his father think that they, that he was killed by wild animals. And later on, we see that Joseph was sold again. But this time, he was sold into Egypt, into Pharaoh's house. I mean, excuse me, Potiphar's house. And we know the story about Joseph and this little trouble he experienced with Mrs. Potiphar, don't we? He was falsely accused. He was thrown in jail for unproven allegations. But all the time, when Joseph was in prison, the Lord was with him. The Lord showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And that he was put in charge of all the prisoners. And then God was with him in whatever he did. He interpreted the, the chief cupbearer's dream. He interpreted the chief baker's dream. And he interpreted Pharaoh's two dreams. He told Pharaoh that his two dreams are one and the same. You're going to have seven years of great abundance throughout the land of Egypt. But your seven years of abundance will be followed by seven years of famine. 
So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. But before he did that, he put a signet ring on his finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen. And he put a gold chain around his neck. And Joseph rode on a chariot. But he put him in charge of all of Egypt. And seven years of abundance came. And seven years of abundance went. And in seven years of famine began. There was famine all throughout the lands. But in Egypt, there was food in Egypt. So Joseph opened up all the storehouses and he sold grain to the Egyptians. All the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph. And one day, guess what happened? 20 years later, when Joseph was around 30 years old, his brothers had come to Egypt to buy some food. They didn't recognize Joseph. But guess what? Joseph recognized them. Eventually, Joseph revealed himself to his family, to his brothers, and they were shocked. But later, they were glad and they were reunited. And Joseph sent word for the entire family to come on out. Join us in Egypt. Everything's going to be okay. You can leave everything behind and come join us here because everything we have is here for you. Joseph kissed all of his brothers and he wept over them. So they loaded up all their animals, didn't have to worry about anything, and they joined the family there. He told his dad, he said, come on, join us, because there's still five more years of famine to come. Later, when Jacob died, Joseph's brothers were afraid that he would take revenge based on what happened 20 years ago. Church, some of us are still concerned and worried about what happened 20 years ago. Some people didn't do you right, and you're concentrating on what happened 20 years ago. But we got to rise up and be gentle towards those people. They begged for forgiveness, but when Joseph heard their appeal, he cried because revenge was the last thing on his mind. Joseph did the right thing. And God calls us to do the right thing. We have to do the right thing. He calls us to love one another as he has first loved us. Because he said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples because you have love for one another. A love toward one another is a demonstration of hospitality, isn't it? A love toward one another is a uniting together. A love toward one another displays gentleness. Gentleness has a way of creating new bonds. When we do the right thing in a gentle spirit, it will create a special kind of affection. It will create a special kind of kindness towards our strangers, towards the poor, towards our family members, toward our loved ones. It will create that. When you do the right thing, it will cost you everything. It will cost you your time. It will cost you your resources. It will cost you some sleepless nights. It will cause you to cry, but it will also cause you to leap for joy. When you do the right thing, you will uh, present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. When you do the right thing, it will uh, uh, cause you to become habitual in your practices. It's easy to do the right thing and to put God first. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God in all his righteousness and everything will be given unto you. Every single day when we make choices, they will show whether we will be courageous in our choices or cowardly. We choose between the right thing and the convenient things to do. We either are going to stick with our convictions or we're going to cave in to the sake of comfort. We're either going to cave in for the sake of greed cave in because we want everybody else's approval. We are going to either believe in God and trust in his holy word, even when we don't know everything that he's doing, or we will cower in the corners of doubts. We will cower in the corners of fears and second-guess every decision he's directing us for. 
God calls everyone to be gentle. Go look at Philippians. Look at the story of Joseph and all the trials that he went through. It's not easy to do the right thing when no one will know that you're doing it. It's in those moments when you are by yourself and you are doing the right thing. That's when your character is strong. That's when your character becomes, builds up those muscles. And then you grow. You mature in Christ. Dr. King Jr. says, Cowardice asks, is it safe? Consciousness asks, is it popular? But character asks, is it right? We are called to do the right thing. God is calling each and every one of us. If we don't have a relationship with him, he calls us to do the right thing. You do that by studying God's word, getting into the scriptures, and studying them. Not only reading them, but Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 15, to study, to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, but one who rightly divides the word of truth. Faith, repentance, and baptism puts one into Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. The question is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you believe that with all your heart, you can accept him into your life. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1. And then in verse number 6, he says, without it, without this faith, it is impossible to please God. And the question is, are we looking to please God or are we looking to please man? If we're looking to please man, then you're going to go around and around in this circle. But if you're looking to please God, and that's your number one priority, then he gives you every, every I'm everlasting life. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Amen. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you have not giving your life over to him, and you want to, and you want to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you can do that this morning. But the water is ready. We're ready. If you want us to pray with you, we can do that too. Why don't you come as we together stand and sing this song? <laughs>